Good morning, church. It's good to be with you guys this morning. And as we continue in our renewal series, uh, we've been talking a lot about what it means to be renewed. And we see that renewal is really us drawing near to Christ, us drawing near to God to come to know Him and be known by Him. My goal this morning, as we continue through this series, is to show you that renewal is not just a a phase in your life. It's not just a first step. It is really the entirety of your Christian walk. Renewal is indeed what we will all experience throughout our lifetime. For instance, Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writes this. He says, you have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. And in this one verse, we see here that our new self is being renewed. It is a continuous renewal, a progression that starts from the moment we've been, we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior to the end of our life. In other words, renewal means there's a change a change in our hearts, a change in the way we live, a change in our minds, the way we think, a change in our emotions, the way we feel, a change in the way we handle difficult situations. And, and this is something that I believe helps us manage through times of trials and change like we are experiencing this past two years, right? It helps us figure out how, to, how do we deal with things that change on us, that Things that where our environments, our contexts challenge us. And we are challenged in our faith. We're challenged in the way we walk. We, we've been mentioning, we say this over and over again to ourselves, we can't wait to get back to normal life. But what is normal? Life is constantly changing because we are being renewed. We are being transformed into the image of Christ. And that is the goal of renewal. And so this morning, I want us to help see that. I want us to ask the right questions to help us not try to go back to what's normal, but how do we move forward towards Christ and all that we do? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter chapter 3. And we will be flipping around the book of Philippians a lot, but our main central passage will be chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. And in this one passage in Philippians, written by Paul, we will find here five requirements, five requirements to help us step forward in spiritual renewal. Let me go and read the passage for us. I'm reading from the ESV, Philippians chapter 3, starting with verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What we see here, the first point, our first requirement is that we must have proper awareness. We must have proper awareness. Paul here is aware of his spiritual status before God. Right, he's, Paul is blatantly aware of his imperfect spiritual state. Starting right off the bat, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Right, this is, and we have to remember who this is, who's writing this. The apostle Paul, who spent years proclaiming Christ, spent years traveling around planting churches, making disciples. This is the Apostle Paul, and yet here he says that he has not yet already obtained this or already perfect. He realized that as he's writing this letter in prison, in prison for the gospel, writing this letter towards the end of his life, he does not 
seek to stop and just relax. He doesn't seek to stop and smell the roses. He instead, he said, he pressed on. Verse 13 repeats that. Brothers, I do not consider to have, a, I have made him my own. He understands that perfection is not yet his. What we see here is that renewal begins with a proper assessment of where you're at with your relationship with God. A proper assessment of where your heart is at. Do you truly know God? Not just know about God, but know God personally in a relationship. For instance, when we think about prayer warriors, when we think about those who pray a lot, those who we consider, man, their spiritual life is in place because they're praying all the time. They're praying for me. They're praying for others. They're praying for the church. They're praying for this world. And we're encouraged by these prayer warriors. And we think about them as spiritually mature. But recognize this. These mature Christians who are praying all the time, they're doing so because they realize more and more so that they are far away from perfection. That's why they're praying. It's because they need help. This is why we should all be praying. Because we should all be aware of where we are at. J.I. Packer, the late theologian, he says this in his book, Knowing God. He says, we must learn to measure ourselves, not by our knowledge about God, not by our gifts and responsibilities in the church, but by how we pray and what goes on in our hearts. So we have to be aware of that. Be aware of where we're at. Be aware that we are currently still in a race, a marathon. I mean, that's what Paul's imagery, that's what he's using here in Philippians. He's using an athletic imagery of a race, of pressing on in this race. Paul's aware that the goal of his life was not to plant this many churches or make this many disciples. He didn't care about the numbers. Those, those churches he plants, the disciples he made, they were just markers telling him how far he has gone. It's like when you're running a marathon, you see that you've passed the five-mile mark, the seven-mile mark. They're just markers, but you're not done with the race. Paul understands here that the Christian life is a marathon, meaning we can never be satisfied with what we have. We can never be satisfied with what we've done because we're always pursuing something more than earthly riches. And so Paul presses on. And there are, there are probably several reasons why we ourselves may be tempted not to press on. Let me give you perhaps two reasons. We may not press on because perhaps we're comfortable with our lives. Perhaps we have made our home here on earth and we forget that we're actually on a trek towards our heavenly home. And so we focus instead on safeguarding our earthly home, our earthly treasures, safeguarding them because that's where we've grown comfortable. Or perhaps we don't press on because we feel inadequate. We feel weak. Perhaps your guilt, your shame has become a heavy burden upon your soul. And it's just discouraging to keep trying. And you feel like this race perhaps is not meant for you. And so instead you focus on your weakness, on, upon your sins, your guilt, your worth before God. And that's why it's hard for you to press on. I think this is where we are reminded by Pastor Hanley's message last week, that the focus is not upon ourselves, that like Moses, we aren't to focus upon our own weaknesses, but our focus needs to be on Christ, which leads us to the second requirement here, that we need to have a proper direction in where we run, right? Because when I say I'm stepping forward, I could be stepping forward in this direction, but if I actually need to go back that way, I'm going the wrong way, Right? So when we step forward, we got to make sure we're stepping forward in the right direction, that we're moving towards the goal that we all are pursuing, which is Christ. But let's take a look at the passage here. In verse 12, Paul here says that he is not yet already perfect, but I press on. He presses on to make it his own. 
press on to make it his own. Well, what is it? And what is, what is this, this object that Paul has not yet already obtained? Well, this refers back to verse 11. And in verse 11, he says that by any means possible, Paul will try to attain the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead, what is that? Well, that speaks to Paul's future hope of his glorified body, of him being resurrected from the dead to be with Christ in that way so that he has a new body free of sin, worthy to be before God, to be in relationship with God. And Paul here understands that the resurrection of his body cannot come without the work of Christ. If you look down at verse, uh, verse 21 of chapter 3, Verse 21, chapter 3, talks here about the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. See, Paul understands his perfection cannot happen without Christ. But how does this relate to us pursuing Christ? How does pursuing perfection relate to us pursuing Christ? Well, this is the part where we need to understand that we can't be in a perfect relationship with Christ without ourselves being perfectly holy and righteous before Christ. See, this is why renewal requires change and transformation because we realize we're not just trying to reset ourselves. We're actually trying to transform ourselves, move forward under the power of Christ so that we can be with our Lord and Savior. He is our prize, our goal. Paul understood that. He saw that he could not fully be with Christ without himself being perfected. And so our holiness It's not meant to make us feel better. It's not meant for us to do good deeds. Our holiness is meant to draw us near to Christ. This helps us gain perspective into how Paul deals with his ministry, speaks about his life work. Because Paul, he does not simply work because he feels compelled to. He sees that the work itself is what brings him closer to Christ. And he says this throughout Philippians. For instance, back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You see, he understood that ministry apart from Christ is no ministry at all. And while he here is recognized that while he lives, he is to be Christ to the people around him, to be Christ, to evangelize, to make disciples. And yet he realized that's not his end goal because he does not gain the prize until he has died and is with his Lord and Savior. This is how he presses himself. This is how he pushes on. Paul realized that his life meant nothing unless he can gain Christ. Chapter 3, verse 9, Paul writes this. He says that he hopes to gain Christ and to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but to have a righteousness that comes from the, through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He pursues all this so that he may know Christ. This, this is what Paul aims to gain. This is what he aims to have in his life. His ministry is not about having the numbers, not about having himself feel good about his work, but so that he can have Christ in his life. You see here that our spiritual renewal, our growth, is not connected with how much you get done, not how much you get done in the name of God, not, not how much you know about God, not how much theology you've gained, not how many classes you've taken, not how many times you've taught. Your spiritual growth is connected to how deep you know our God. See, what we learn from Scripture, all the theology we may have, the training we may have, the ministries you serve in, the teams that you may lead, the events that we may plan, 
I mean, even considering just for myself the semi degree I might have or whatever else, all those stuff doesn't matter if you don't know Christ personally. It doesn't matter if it doesn't draw you closer to your Lord and Savior. Again, taking from J.I. Packer from Knowing God, paraphrasing this time, he says, he writes this in his book, one can know a great deal about God or know a great deal about godliness without much knowledge of God. Pretty much saying that you can know a lot of theology, you can even know how you have to act before this world in godliness, but if you do not know God himself, if you do not know Jesus Christ, it means nothing. Let's consider this in a more practical way. We heard from Pastor Kevin that we are to take Sabbath, take a break from our work, to, to be able to you know, step away for a moment to get ourselves refreshed, renewed to our souls. But I want us to remember that a Sabbath is not just to take a break so that you can do more work. Remember the point of the Sabbath. It's not to do more work later. The point of the Sabbath is so that you can enjoy your relationship with Christ. Be drawn closer to Him and His blessings. It's always about the relationship. It's always about pursuing Christ. This leads us to the third requirement, is to have a proper mindset. To have a proper mindset. You see, we, we understand that we are to pursue Christ. We heard that many times. But where does it begin? Where does it start? Well, it starts with the mind. It starts with a mindset. That the mind is a theme that we see throughout the, the book of Philippians here. It's an important theme that ties the book together. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writes, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He, he wants this unitedness of the same mind, to be together in this way, to think and focus on the same things. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So we see here this mind is not just having the same beliefs, but it's having the same mind that, the, that Jesus had, that Jesus had for us. When Jesus did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but humble himself to be a servant, to die on the cross for our sins, to sacrifice his life so that we may obtain salvation, to declare him as Lord, to have that mind and to be united and, to sh and share that mind amongst all of us, to have this kind of mindset. The mind is important even towards the end of the letter, chapter 4, verse 8 where Paul here writes an encouragement to the Philippians saying, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. The mind is important. And we come back to our passage Philippians chapter 3, we see here in verse 15, Paul wants us to have the same mind. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God revealed that also to you. We are to share the same mindset moving forward. Now, what is this mindset? Looking here now at verse 13, and this really is the thrust of this morning's message, the mindset is focused upon looking forward and not backwards. Looking forward and not backwards. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I made it my own, but one thing I do consider, and can hear the word consider is actually synonymous to think, so it's about the mind here. One thing I do consider, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind this, when Paul writes this, yeah, sure, it could refer to his achievements in the past as a Pharisee. Right? He did earlier in chapter 3, he talked about all that he has gained before his conversion. He counted all those things as loss. 
But the immediate context here in our little passage, speaking about Paul here, speaking about his life as a believer, right? speaking about his life pressing on towards pursuing Christ as a follower of Christ. He's speaking about his constant pursuit of Christ after his conversion. And so what Paul here is talking about, about forgetting what lies behind, is that Paul realized you cannot run forward with your head turned around backwards. You'll stumble and fall if you do that. Instead, you're to focus the head, push forward. And we see this type of example throughout Scripture. For instance, Jesus tells us to remember Lot's wife. And the story of Lot back in Genesis was when him and his wife, his family was leaving Sodom as God was raining fire upon that sinful city. Lot's wife turned her head to take one last look at Sodom, her city, her home. And what happened? She turned into a pillar of salt. We are to obey God's command with a focused, forward thinking, forgetting what lies behind. And so Paul here does that. He focused upon what lies ahead. And what lies ahead of Paul is the resurrection of his body, the coming of Christ, when we will be fully transformed and perfected, and we will be with God for eternity. This is what Paul has to look forward to. And so, forgetting what lies behind, straying forward to what lies ahead, are you pursuing? Are you pursuing that time when you get to be with your Lord and Savior? The time when you can have a perfect relationship with Him. Nothing, no tension, no sin that will get in the way ever. It will just be a joyful, wonderful, peaceful relationship. What this tells us, what this one verse tells us is that we have to be careful. Be careful of our past and the danger of our past, of danger of being stuck in our past. Now, I'm not saying that our past is not important, right? If, if you go through Bible counseling and you understand the way, you know, we are to counsel people, we actually should know people's past. It's important. The past is what makes us who we are today. But our past can also hinder us in moving forward. Our past can, can be an obstacle that we have to hurdle across. And it can stop us from truly pursuing Christ. For instance, our past may contain sin and guilt upon which you have not found peace with yet. And it lays heavy upon your heart and you, and you focus upon your weakness. You focus upon your sins. You focus upon this guilt that hangs like this five-ton weight. And what happens is that it tangles us up. It stops us from running forward. Instead, when we try to move forward from that, when we focus so much upon past guilt and sin, that maybe the way we try to go forward is try to atone for that sin. Right? And so we try to do a lot. We try to pray a lot. We try to read by. We try to serve at church. We try to do things to help us feel better about ourselves. Because we're so stuck with what's happened, what we failed in in the past. And we forget. We forget that that is not pursuing Christ. That is you trying to atone for yourself. You see, the reason why the cross is so important to us, why we say the cross is so free, is because Jesus said on the cross that he will die for your sins and he will remember them no more. That's free. And that allows us to pursue our Lord and Savior with the right heart and the right mindset. Or consider your past. And as you can see your past, you consider maybe your past success and accomplishments. And these things are good things. You've done, you made disciples, you served the church, you spent many years doing so, 20, 30 years serving the church. And perhaps you just figure it's time to retire, time to relax. And, and you see all the fruit you made, all the disciples you've mentored. In the years you have served, you figure out now is the time to ride out the rest of your life. And 
not saying you shouldn't ever take a break from ministry. You should stop when you find the right time. But we have to remember even when we take a break, even when we retire from serving, and when we decide that it's time for us to live our next stage of our life until our death, we do so remembering that we are to press on. We do so remembering that we have not yet obtained perfection. But that we are still yet pursuing Christ. And so don't allow your past success and accomplishment cause you to relax in this race, in this race for Christ. Or consider our past as we consider our past traditions or events. Past traditions or events where we may think, wow, I remember that event. It was great. We should do that again. Or we look back at certain traditions, perhaps traditions our church here has hold on to for a while, and we realize these traditions are an important part of our church, they're a part of our DNA. And there's nothing wrong with these events and traditions. They're, in fact, good stuff. They're effective. That's why we remember them fondly. But we have to remember that these events and traditions don't signal spiritual growth. They do not signal spiritual maturity. And so we cannot allow then our our programs, our traditions to dictate our pursuit of Christ because spiritual maturity and renewal is about how deep again do you know your Lord and Savior? How deep do you know God? You see, the whole concept of renewal here is about moving forward with hope in this way, hope of the future, hope that we can continue to draw closer and closer to Christ. And it understands, it helps us understand and see that our past, our past trials, our past events, our past success is the work of God bringing us closer and closer to Him. And what that means is that nothing has happened in the past that has happened without reason or purpose. They have all been used by God to draw you closer. And that's what it's all about. And as we see God working in all this, we also must remember to have a proper dependency upon God. That as we talk about spiritual renewal, this is not a human man-made effort. This is God's work in your life. And we see this throughout the passage, right? Paul here, he writes verse 12, he says that Christ Jesus has made me his own, right? Christ is the one who died for Paul, and Christ is the one who died for you. And when you went to the cross, he already knew who you were, who you are. He has made you his own. Verse 14 tells us here that Paul presses towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see here that this is a call from God. God is the one who's calling, beckoning, pulling us closer to him. This is a, a, this is a reminder of what Paul wrote earlier in the book, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is constantly working in your life, calling you forward, calling you to himself, We see that in verse 15 as well. Chapter 3, verse 15. If in anything you think otherwise, you think differently about this, you have a different goal in mind, you have a different pursuit, God will reveal that also to you. He will show you where you're wrong. And oftentimes when he does that to you, it comes in the form of trials, it comes in the forms of hardships, it comes in the form of pain and hurt. To show you that you are off track a little bit. And he's trying to correct you so that you are on the right track towards Christ. We are to pursue God in this way. Remembering that it is indeed by God's help, by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to pursue Christ. We see this laid out in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, 
work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so we see here that spiritual maturity, as we talk about renewal, talking about us drawing closer to God, this that the spiritual renewal here is not measured by how long it's been since your last burst of anger or how long it's been since your last fall to pornography. It's not measured by how long you've maybe read your Bible this morning or prayed to God at night. It's not measured by how you're even able to persevere through trials that you guys may be going through right now. It's not about ending this trial and going forward. Right, it's, we have here a wide range of people, wide range of context. Right, and for you know, for those who are going back to school, high schoolers, or for college, it's not about trying to get through this period of time. That's not how you draw closer to God. When you graduate from school, you you may not be anywhere closer to God than when you started. The way we measure spiritual renewal, the way we measure that. It's by how deep you have drawn close to know God in your life. How close you have come to depend upon him. How close you've come to see that God is all-powerful and he is your rock. And we, we are, we are weak. We can't do this on our own. And we need God. How much have you gone to pray to God asking for help? How much have you gone to God and see that you need to know him better so that you can walk forward closer to him? Spiritual renewal is about your relationship with God and how God works in your life. And so we see here spiritual renewal doesn't work without God's help. This tells us that we are not only just to serve God, not just to serve him out of obedience, out of just getting things done. But God also cares about how we serve him. How we serve him. That, that we put our trust in him as we continue to do things at church. From the big things to the small things. From, from leading music on stage to stacking up chairs. Are you doing it with the dependency upon God? Are you doing it in prayer and humility? Understanding that God is the one who's carrying you in this relationship helps us even when we fail in our walks and we will indeed go through our ups and downs, right? We all here know that there are indeed mountains and valleys in our Christian walks. And when we go through certain dark periods, we are to remember God continues to work in you and he is your strength and your portion forever. God is the one who helps us through all this. And when we remember this, we remember it, hel- it actually helps us to even think about our past in the right way. That our past is no longer a hindrance to us. What we see again, when we look upon our past, we, what we see is we see God working constantly, drawing us closer and closer to Him. That tells us we can depend upon our God. Paul, towards the end of the book of Philippians, he writes this in chapter 4, verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And the fifth requirement is to have a proper unity with one another as we pursue Christ. This is where our renewal series will take a turn from an inward focus to a community focus. Because we, we see here that Paul, in our passage, he understands that, that the church cannot be unified unless each one of us, unless each one of us is pursuing the same prize. In verse 15, Paul here changes pronouns. He goes from I to us. And he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. 
to pursue in this way, to drive forward in this way, to pursue the same prize. We see here that a spiritual renewal is indeed a private endeavor. We are to, you know, make sure our quiet times, our times with God, our personal relationship with God is strong. But it is also, our spiritual renewal is also a team-driven, church-driven community renewal. Verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have attained. This is a team-driven pursuit. We are indeed running a race, but we're running a race together as a group. The team that's driven after the same goal, the same prize to have Christ in our life. And throughout this letter, Paul here balances the balances the the individual pursuit and the unity that he hopes to see in the Philippian church. We see earlier in chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, Paul here tells the Philippians to have unity. He writes this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Verse 4, let us each let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. And Paul writes this in the context of saying we are to have the same mind of Christ to glorify him. This is how we ought to not look out for our own interests, but look out for the interests of others. Meaning we pursue Christ, but we also want others to pursue Christ because that is their best interest. Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 2, I entreat Judea, Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Two women in the Philippian church who were having conflict. Paul seeks to have them to agree with one another, understanding how important it is to have a unity within the church. And so we see here spiritual renewal is not just an individual pursuit, but it's a corporate one. It's a collective effort from the young to the old across all life stages and generations. This is something that we all here in this room, in the overflow, in, online, on the web stream, we are all in this together p- to pursue Christ. And this challenges us. This challenges us to think about where we're at the challenges to think about our ministries, to think about our groups that we're in, the community groups, the small groups, the fellowships. This challenges us to think about our ministries, the teams we work with. For instance, I'm the young adult pastor, and I lead a, our young adult group called In Transit. And, and the word In Transit signifies that you know, the young adult stage is a period of transition. It's a period of change. And that's certainly true for young adults. They just graduated from undergrad. They're trying to figure out where to live. They're trying to figure out their careers, figuring out relationships and marriage, trying to figure all these things out. But if there's any takeaway from this morning's message, is to remember that we are all in transit, right? We are all in this process of change, that we don't stop when we get married. We don't stop when we have kids. And for those who have kids, you certainly know that change is constantly happening. None of us here is done with this race. And this challenges us because we have to think then about where we're at. One thing I hear from those who have been in our young adult group, um, maybe for years, um, or maybe they have left for a while and they come back and visit and, and so on, and they'll, they'll tell me that the fellowship just doesn't feel the same because there's new people there, a different feel, different atmosphere, different culture. And I understand that. I sympathize with that because it does indeed change and it's hard to deal with change, isn't it? But isn't that the point? Isn't that the point that we are all constantly growing and changing? Isn't the point that that our groups, our ministries, they do indeed change. They don't ever always stay the same. That no matter what age you're at, what life stage you're in, what group you think you may belong to, do you realize that we're all still on the same team? 
part of the same church, pursuing Christ together. We are to do this in a united pursuit. And so ask yourself in your heart, what is, what is it that you're dealing with? You see, we all belong in this together. We're all pursuing Christ together, and that is a great joy and a great encouragement. To know that we have those who have ran the race longer than us to help us. We have those who, are, who may have run the race for lesser time than us. And they also encourage us because we see their vibrancy and, and, and so on. We all pursue Christ together. We're all encouraged together. We all walk through our valleys and mountains together. This is a journey that we are all are on. And we all hope to reach the same destination Jesus Christ. And truly, the beauty of the church shines brightest when there is indeed a united pursuit of Christ. And so the big idea then for this morning is that spiritual renewal involves moving the heart and mind forward to pursue Christ with proper awareness, direction, mindset, dependency, and unity. Let me end with a few more application points on this. When we, first, when we first shut down over a year ago and we moved our ministries online, I, I remember I, I immediately started working on a set of worksheets to help um, the young adults and collegians and whoever else they wanted to share with, I blessed them to send those out, uh, to, to work on their hearts because I figure that this shut down in our society, nation, church is a, disrupt- is a disruption in our normal busyness and habits. And in that disruption allows an opportunity for us not to stop our lives and wait, but to examine our hearts. See, this is how the process we think, how we deal with change in our, in our times and our context to, to really move forward in all that we do to take advantage of every context we're in, to pursue Christ. And I want them to, to use the time to examine their hearts. And, and this is part of us moving forward together. And now that we're trying to regather back here at this church, we've been using this term reopen, which is, you know, not a bad overall term. We're certainly trying to get back together, regather in person, um, and praying that one day we can do so without masks, with everyone being healthy and safe. But I want us to think about this term reopening and not to treat that term as if we're trying to restart a computer. Right? This is not a reboot of the same program because the goal of church is not to always return back to status quo. The goal of the church is to move forward, every single one of us, to pursue Christ. And so that means re-examining our ministries, our programs, our groups, our teams, our events. Recognizing that they are indeed good things, but are they where they're supposed to be at? Even consider what the situation we're in now, this uncertainty of, this, of the Delta variant, which actually causes us to slow down a little bit, right? Perhaps God is telling us as we are reopening, perhaps we should take this time to analyze our priorities in our ministries. If we are to use the five points that I laid down this message, perhaps we need to take a moment to look at our ministry and see if we're properly aware of where we're at spiritually. And then take a time to analyze that we're heading towards a proper direction in our ministries. And then maybe then we think about how then do we train and equip our team members, our volunteers, our leaders to have this proper mindset in this ministry. And then to also enforce a proper dependency in Christ, on the Holy Spirit, in prayer, on God. And then finally do so with a proper unity in how we pursue Christ together in this ministry. You see, this changes the vision of whatever ministry you may be part of changes how we do ministry, changes how we way we work together, changes the culture of the church, changes it from running programs to pursuing Christ together. And, 
and a final kind of encouragement, final note that I want to say here, is that as we pursue Christ together, both personally and corporately, recognize that Paul sees this, sees spiritual renewal as gospel ministry. This is indeed what we're called here to do when, we, when we're called to evangelize, we're called to be light in this world. Let me end with this passage, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Where Paul here writes, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. We see here that our spiritual renewal actually is gospel ministry. And so when we talk about coming back to seeing where we're at with God, when we encourage you guys to pursue Christ, pursue God and your personal relationship with Him, we're not doing this saying that you guys should take a pause in your life. This is actually gospel ministry so that you can become lights in this wicked and crooked world. So let us pursue Christ then together both in our individual lives and in our corporate life, because Christ is indeed worth the prize. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for the gift of Christ that frees us from our sins, frees us from our guilt, our shame, and frees us to pursue you the joy, the reward, the treasure that we can have in you. Lord, let us have our minds focused upon this, to see our heavenly kingdom as our heavenly home, and to pursue Christ, who, who's there right now, interceding on our behalf, our Lord and Savior. God, let us do so. Let us continue to pursue you, pursue your son, to know you and to be known by you because this relationship with you is what matters. It's what moves us forward. And so thank you, God, for this race. Let us then endure with joyfulness, with freedom. Let us endure to the end so that we may gain you. Be with us all. I pray all this in your holy in precious name, amen.